So good evening, respected teachers and dear friends. Welcome all to our first online class of this year, 2021 on gene therapy organized by ACCLFP. I am Dr. Sudeshna hosting today's online session. So first of all, I would like to thank our ACCLMP president, Dr. Shushruk Sen, and the organizing committee for arranging and conducting such an event. We have chosen the topics for the online session, that is the session today, as well as the upcoming sessions, keeping in mind our young members, that is a postgraduate trainees into account, but all interested members, including faculties, are welcome to join our online classes. So today's topic, as we all know, is gene therapy. So gene therapy sector is becoming a experience like a, it's an uh, it's experiencing gene therapy sector is experiencing an acceleration. So it's definitely a very demanding topic and tough sometimes maybe as a uh, reading textbooks may not be enough. And ACCLMP can't think anyone other than Dr. Uh, Onindo Das Gupta to enlighten us with his amazing teaching skills. It's a great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Onindo Das Gupta, Professor in HOD of Department of Biochemistry, Calcutta National Medical College. He is also the editor in chief of ACCLMP Journal, Journal of Applied Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine. He's a brilliant teacher, a brilliant mentor with about 20 years of teaching experience in the field of biochemistry. I want to emphasize upon one point here that most of you who have remained his students has experienced his incredible abilities to make a complex concept clear and understandable to each and everyone attending his class. So thank you, sir, for taking your time out from your busy schedule. And we are fortunate enough to have you for our first online class. Thank you, sir. And now I want to announce two important things. Participants to mute their audio throughout the online class. And since we are having two classes today and tomorrow, so each class will be of one hour duration. And answer sessions will be tomorrow. We'll, taking, uh, we'll be uh, taking questions tomorrow after uh, sir finishes the class, uh, classes. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Yes, uh, welcome, Dr. Subeshna. And good afternoon to all of the participants. So, uh, I think that is rightly Dr. Shubhashna told that the gene therapy is such a topic which is not found exclusively in a particular one book. And we all know that in uh, postgraduate training, uh, reading one book is not sufficient, but there is a limit. We know that uh, how many books can a PGD uh, study having his normal duties, particularly in these busy scheduled days of COVID duties. So we decided from the SSCLMP that we should take uh, some uh, classes uh, which uh, can cover such topics which cannot be found in one book. So today's class is like that class, that is uh, gene therapy. And I start my class with sharing my screen. Yes, I think that it is uh, visible to everybody. The screen is visible to everybody. Yes, visible, sir. Okay, very good. So we start with the gene therapy that can be initiated with this uh, picture or with this photograph. She is the first human being to be treated successfully with the novel idea of gene theory. Her name is Ashanti de Silva. I am reiterating the word is because she's still alive now. And she received the first clinical gene therapy. Uh, but if we know her history, then uh, it is very interesting to know or uh, come to the conclusion that how a novel therapy can be permitted in a child with the consent of her parents. Now, in 1989, the parents of four-year-old Ashanti lived with horror that their beloved daughter was suffering from an incurable gene-based immune deficiency. 
She had been diagnosed at two years old after suffering a string of debilitating infections and a particular type of that is severe combined immunodeficiency disorder was deemed to due to the adenosine deaminase enzyme deficiency. You know that this ADA deficiency causes this combined immunological disorder due to its attack on the lymphocytes, which heavily depend on the supply of the product of this adenosine deaminase, that is for purine synthesis, for rapid proliferation and division into immunological cells during an attack by an, any infective organism. So, particularly the lymphocytes, they are affected because they, they depend more on this enzyme for their continuous proliferation and for continuous recycling of the purine synthesis. So the enzyme deficiency definitely causes a disease that attacks the immune defense and results in severe combined immunological disorder. So that is due to definitely the gene deficiency, uh, defect in the gene for ADA. And still then, the doctors, there, as there was no gene therapy, the doctors started their treatment because they cannot leave a patient dying when there is no treatment, as you know. So we have to give some treatment. And naturally, she also received regular injections of, that is polyethylene glycol and ADA combination. That is an artificial form of the ADA enzyme to boost a T-cell account, count. Uh, but the treatment started declining in effectiveness over time. And after two years of injections, Ashanti was no longer responding to the treatment. Then, without a groundbreaking change in the way, her ADA de deficiency, if that was not dealt with, she would never reach her childhood, or sorry, adulthood. And this type of skit would sentence her to a short life of isolation, suffering, and ultimately death. But her parents, they didn't give up. And in 1990s, Ashanti's parents, parents, that is Raj and Van de Silva, connected with the geneticist Frank French Anderson, who was an American US based uh, scientist. Not only scientist, you will be very interested to know that he was a physician. Physician turned molecular biologist, turned geneticist. And ultimately, he proved that the doctors can also be very good biochemists, geneticists, and molecular biologists. So French Anderson, who was lobbying for permission to move forward with, the, with his own products for application on the gene therapy, uh, Ashanti's parents were fortunate to be in the right place at the right time and gave permission to French Anderson to uh, put his experiments on a daughter. And then the corrected gene was infiltrated or infused in her. The parents, uh, when they were asked that why did they allow Dr. Anderson to carry on his first experiment on the human being to their child, they replied rhetorically to the media, what choice did we have else? But that proved to be right. As this person, he dealt very well with this gene therapy and Hence, he's known as the father of gene therapy. In fact, he is French Anderson because the result was only success. In conservative terms, the results of Anderson's courageous clinical trial were nothing short of astonishing. Over the first six months, the girl's T cell count was vertically rising, and she quickly tested for this T cell count at normal levels, and her health took a remarkable uptick over the following two years. So, something successful was there. And that was nothing but the healthy ADA gene that was introduced into her body by this person, that is James French Anderson. Ashanti suffered no significant side effects, and the trial then naturally it started adding other patients also. Now the thing was that that although the doctors opted to have Ashanti uh, to continue the polyethylene glycol ADA injections at a modest rate, because this is the ethics of gene therapy that until and unless it is proved beyond curative, proved beyond doubt as curative, you have to continue the palliative treatments as well. So she was able to attain the school with the gene therapy added with other children and leave a relatively normal life. And now she's still alive. So Shanti De Silva is still alive today after a successful gene therapy. 
a success of a novel therapy tested with chai. So this was the story of Ashanti De Silva, who first received the gene therapy in the human history. But the history begins where? Because since the deoxyribonucleic acid molecule has been identified as gene, that is the molecule of heredity, it has been focused uh, for altering the disorders associated with heredity or the genetic structure. And so genes have long been considered as medicines. But this consideration of the genes as medicine, this has a long, long way to go. Because if we see then that starting from discovery of the genes as a hereditary markers to the manipulation and manipulation at a greater level, and then being able to change the construction of the gene or structure of the gene in such a way that it can be targeted at a particular defective uh, area of base damage. So this is the brief history of the gene therapy. This is not the gene therapy exactly, but this is the brief history. How the human beings, they started with the discovering of the hereditary molecule and ended up with the therapy of that molecule itself. That means ended up with the structural engineering of that molecule itself. So Frederick Griffith first in 1928 described the transformation principle. You have heard about this famous experiment and you have read it in your books also that with the strains of living smooth and rough living strains, uh, he proved that when he incubated the dead smooth strain with the mixed uh, living rough strains, the rough strains, which were non-virulent initially, they were converted into virulent rough strains by infusion, infusion of something from the dead smooth strain. So he called that as transformation. Transformation of what? Transformation of the living rough cells from virulent to non-virulent strains that could kill the rat after injection. But he was not still sure that what might be that uh, thing, that means what might be the chemical nature of that thing. In 1944, Avery, MacLeod and McCarthy described that genetic information is carried by gene. That means they proved that that transforming molecule was nothing but chemically that was DNA. In 1952, Joshua Lederberg, the great microbiologist and geneticist who left his medical career for the sake of genetics, he was in fact a doctor, not a doctor, in fact, he couldn't, he didn't give his final MDBS, final uh, MD exam in the US because he left his medical line in between for his love towards genetics and joined as an assistant professor in an American university there. But initially, he also started his career as a medical student. So Joshua Lederberg first described that transduction is a mechanism for gene transfer by putting the uh, experiment of the viral phages on the bacteria. He showed for the first time that yes, genes can be transported from one organism to another. And in 1961, Howard Deming, for the first time, he discovered the enzyme reverse transcriptase and showed that in fact, the RNA viruses has the capability of carrying out the genetic recombinations as well as the transfer of genes from their own to the human being. In 1962, Wachlaw Zybalski performed the first documented heritable gene transfer in a mammalian cell. But the breakthrough came in fact in 1966, that is not shown here. In 1966, Edward Tatum, he first supposed that these genes can be transferred from through the transferred using the viral vectors from the artificial genetic genetically recombined uh, structures to the man being. But he proposed that. 
But the proof of concept, that means his proposal was proved in the laboratory by Roger and Parada in 1968. When they demonstrated in the laboratory that yes, Edward Tatum's conception was right. So their experiment that is why was known as proof of concept. They demonstrated definitely that virus could mediate, it, mediate the gene transfer. And then uh, in 1989, Rosenberg, Rosenberg, he conducted the first officially approved gene transfer in humans. What he did, he in fact chose the uh, tumor necrosis factor and combined it into the retroviral genome to infiltrate the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And then he successfully uh, at least uh, reduced the symptoms of some cancers like uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma, etc. So the journey had began, but um, in 1990, it, re it, it received its peak as uh, previously described that Ashanti de Silva was successfully treated by gene therapy by French Anderson. But suddenly there was a break in 1999 when an 18-year-old boy who was being treated for the deficiency of ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency he was being treated by adenovirus-mediated gene transfer, suddenly developed severe immunological assault due to adenoviral infection, in fact, and he died there. And his death, in fact, halted the gene research, gene therapy research, for almost four years in the European countries and in the United States of America. But meanwhile, in the China, in 2003, it became the first country to approve a gene therapy based product for clinical use. Clinical use means officially they approved the clinical use of the gene therapy for P53 mutations in some cancers. And after some time, when the adenoviral vectors were made much less virulent by changes in their genetic structures, changes in their several uh, genetic virulent immunological factors. In 2009, the first successful phase three clinical trial for gene therapy started again in the European Union. And after that in 2012, the European Medical Agency recommended the first, for the first time, a gene therapy product for use in European Union. We will look into that now. So one thing is the effort and one thing is its approval. So we have seen that from this thing, that from the beginning of the Frederick Griffiths experiment through Watson Creek double helix discovery, a long way after uh, surviving the death of J.C. Gelsinger, that is an 18 year old boy, the gene therapy proceeded and ultimately the thing was to get the approval for therapies because everything is meant for the benefit of the human beings. So in 2003, China approved it uh, as the recombinant adenoviral vectors for with the wild type P53 genes for treating with non-small cell lung carcinoma. In 2012, the European Medical Agency approved the that is associated adenovirus or assisted adenovirus for treatment of lipoprotein lipase, severe lipoprotein lipase deficiency. And the drug was the first drug, in fact, who came in the industry in the European countries and American countries that was named as Glybera. In 2015, the first oncolytic virus based gene therapy was introduced again for treatment of melanoma, but that failed. The failure is the pillar of success. The total history of gene therapy and the course of gene therapy. It started with several failures, several failures, but ultimately 
definitely it is going to be a successful story. So in this way, ultimately 100% survival rate was uh, found and then several genetically modified T cells expressing, expressing the chimeric or chimeric antigen receptors that we will study later, they made the success much more complete. So this is the history and approval of the gene therapies. I should know it because otherwise we won't be able to recognize the uh, very hard labors and sacrifices of the human society, uh, which finally reached the successful treatment of some patients with this gene therapy. Now, what is the current scenario of the gene? What this long-term struggle has given us? Now, today, that means up to 2017, about 2,600 approved gene therapy clinical trials had been conducted worldwide or are still being conducted. A total of, among these 2,600, a total of 1,517 clinical trials have been conducted aimed at treating only various cancers. Because there is, we know that still now there is a very uh, low range of effective medicines from a, for the very low numbers of cancers. Otherwise it is most lethal even today. So marking cancer as the most common target for this gene therapy. And the till today, the vectors commonly used have been adenovirus, retrovirus, and naked plasmids, uh, which we will learn in a little bit more detail, not in much detail, a little bit more detail, uh, either today later or tomorrow early. So this is, you can see the countries which have contributed to the history of gene therapy in the world. It's needless to mention, the data are given here, you can see it. And this is an important thing that how many diseases are now being targeted for the gene therapy. So many diseases are there, starting from cancer, then monogenic disease, then infectious diseases, cardiovascular diseases, etc., etc. But highest number of cases who are being under this trial for gene therapy, definitely they belong to cats. So this is a very, very important area for our cancer therapy. But others are not least important because a particular single disease if severe can kill a human being as the cancer can kill a human being also. So gene therapy is important not only for cancer but also for many other diseases. So now what is the definition of this gene therapy? I personally, it is my view that definition uh, cannot be memorized, it has to be understood. Uh, because if you understand the thing, you can define the thing yourself. And that is you will find, you will find that for many, many medical things or matters, there are many definitions. So in the same way, gene therapy is also has many definitions. The easiest one is the gene therapy is an approach to treat, to cure, or ultimately to prevent the diseases by changing the expression of genes within an individual. And if you want to know it in details, then it is like this. Gene therapy is a therapeutic strategy okay, that aims to replace the faulty genes with normal functional genes in the patient's genome in order to treat diseases caused by genetic defects with drugs administered by viral vectors or genetically engineered microorganisms. So this is the complete elaborative definition and this is the holistic summarized definition. Whatever you like to give your ask, you are correct. Because 
the meaning of definition is a statement of the exact meaning of a word. The person who understands can understand it from the holistic meaning also. So now, after studying the history and definition of the gene therapy, now we are gradually moving forward, forward towards application of the gene therapy. But before going to that, we must know that whom to give or whom not to give this gene therapy. So there must be some criteria which need to be satisfied uh, prior to initiation and success of the gene therapy. First one is that genetic defect should be, that means the genetic defect which is going to be treated, it should be a well characterized single gene disorder, should be. Not necessarily it always must be, because we know that cancers, most of the cancers are not single gene defects, they are multiple gene defects. So we have crossed this barrier, and nowadays we are moving towards multiple gene disorders, gene therapy also, by several ways. But if it is a well characterized single gene disorder like this error deficiency, then it is its success rate is much more, uh, and success rate can be achieved much more easily. The second one is that the gene should be isolated and its regulatory regions defined. Yes, if you do not know how the gene is being regulated, uh, like a lacoperon gene, you cannot describe the. Uh, sequence that you have to incorporate in the target gene, uh, in the therapy region. And so, both the mutant and the normal gene must be cloned and sequenced. Otherwise, how can you know that where is the defect? If you do not clone the sickle cell, uh, the gene for the sickle cell anemia, how can you know that there is a change in the uh, sixth position of the beta globulin gene? Then, the introduced gene should function adequately and produce no deleterious effect. So the gene you are going to create in the artificial environment in the laboratory, it should not have any such sequence which can cause any additional or unwanted effect in the recipient. And next, the introduced gene should not interact with the functioning with the other genes. That means the gene you have, suppose you have introduced the gene X and there are already the genes A, B and C present in your genome. So the introduced gene X, it should not interfere with the functioning of the A, B and C. It should do only its own job. It should never interfere with the function of the other genes. I am telling it because many diseases are caused by a group of genes. Some of they are the hub genes or the major genes, and some are the candidate genes. So these candidate genes, they can put their effect through multiple pathways to many effects. Suppose a candidate gene that you have discovered for the growth hormone can also affect the synthesis of melanin in the brain. And so uh, this has to be taken care of, that the introduced gene should not interact with the function of the other genes, and it should function adequately and produce no deleterious effect. The introduced gene should also have a well-defined function, which can be biologically monitored by present techniques. Because before introducing the gene into the human being, we must first monitor its function uh, in the laboratory. So there must be some technique available to you, which can measure, suppose you have synthesized the gene for ADA, how do you know that it is going to be effective in human beings if introduced? So first you have to measure its activity in the laboratory. And then if you find that yes, it is producing ADA protein, then and only then you can be ready with its introduction into the human subjects. Now in the absence of a technique for eliminating the existing mutant gene, the functional gene must function well in the presence of mutant gene. Uh, this is a little bit difficult for you to understand. Uh, for example, that uh, the mutant gene in your body, it is not wiped out from the cell. 
but it is mutant and it is not doing any job rather it is producing some harmful products which is causing harm to your cells now you have created a therapeutic gene and introduce that therapeutic gene into the cell that you call as the functional gene but now what happens if the mutant gene is not removed from the cell the functional gene has to work with the mutant gene beside it always so that's why it is desirable that the mutant gene must not interfere with the expression of the functional gene that is introduced provided if you cannot eliminate the mutant gene now this is where we will understand the difference between the gene replacement therapy and gene repair therapy later now next condition for success is that the outcome of the disease should be accurately predictable and is not curable or controlled by other conventional methods now if the ada is curable by just administration of the enzyme ada then why we should go for the gene therapy because gene therapy has many uh, side effects it is much more costly it is much more laborious and it some definite hazards the target cells should be identified definitely otherwise how can you treat the beta thalassemia if you cannot identify that the rbcs they are the target cells and safe methods of introducing the gene because uh, we have just now read that in the year of 1999 it was the death of a 18 year old boy that was due to the immunological huge immunological reaction of the adenovirus which was taken or selected as a vector for gene therapy nowadays we seldom face because we have selected much more safer methods for introducing the gene through the vector so basically now we once we have uh, understood the limitations or the conditions which must be fulfilled for gene therapy now we proceed one more step that is principles of gene therapy basic principles just first of all this them is that gene augmentation therapy and the second one is gene inhibition therapy gene augmentation therapy is principally very similar very very easy to understand that there is a cell with non functioning gene or idle gene which has stopped functioning and you are simply introducing a functioning gene so that it can function well or function normally in the second one there is a faulty gene which is producing something bad now we have to inhibit that so we go for then gene inhibition therapy we have to create a blocking gene for that there are plenty of ways in fact i will i, I think that i i shall be able to tell them tomorrow in fact the ways how the 1921 look sorry 2000 uh the, the recent nobel prize of the last year was awarded to two female scientists for discovery of this crispr which can block the defective gene so there are so many other ways also we will look into them later gradually so the blocking gene is a very important thing to block the bad genes and the new gene product that blocks the faulty genes and the then cell again starts functioning normally so these two are the basic principles of gene therapy either you augment a non functional gene or you block a bad gene so by which uh general principles we can achieve those first one is the replacement of a defective gene that is known as the classical gene therapy and the second one is the repair of the defective gene now what is the difference between replacement and repair so okay. so just now we will see the illustration after this slide after we understand what the replacement of a defective gene means in fact a gene replacement therapy is the technique of recognizing a faulty gene 
applying a piece of DNA in its correct form through a viral vector known as the carrier molecule to the gene and thus overriding the identified faulty gene with the correct copy. Now, even not removing the faulty gene or stopping the faulty gene here, what you are doing, even overriding it with the replacement of a correct gene. Okay. Because you cannot remove the DNA molecule from the, uh, cannot wipe out or destroy the whole DNA molecule. Okay. So replacement therapy means just replacement. In fact, it is extra addition of a normal gene, leaving the faulty gene in situ sometimes. So hence, its success and failure should be just according. Success is due to the major success for this type of gene therapy has been achieved in the replacement of the defective P53 mutant genes. And the cells receiving the correct genes become more sensitive to the radiation therapy also. So they, they become more sensitive to the uh, adjuvant therapy cells. Now I was just waiting for this illustration. Oh, what does it tell? This illustration tells us that this is a cell with a non-functioning gene, that is this one. Okay. This is the non-functioning gene. This one is the non-functioning gene. Let us put a closer it. Now you have created a functional gene, that is this one, and you are going to replace this gene with the new gene. So you have replaced it, okay. But many times it does occur that the non-functional gene, it remains in the place. It is not replaced, it is there, it is there. But you have also introduced the healthy gene here. So the healthy gene has to perform side by side with the bad gene or the non-functional gene residing just beside it. So that was what I was talking about a few slides before. Uh, that is the conditions for gene success, uh, gene therapy success. That now this non-functioning gene that is still here, it should not inhibit, should not inhibit this functional gene. Okay. So you have to test that in the laboratory first. Otherwise, if it remains in C2, whatever correct genes you have introduced, it will inhibit this correct gene also. So this is the gene replacement error. What are the major limitations of this technique? Due to heterogeneity of the most tumors, because we know that tumors are heterogeneous in nature, and so mutations are also heterogeneous, so multiple mutations may be there. So how many gene targets you choose? Now, infection of every target tumor cells may not be possible also because it is very difficult for the recombinant therapeutic gene to enter selectively into each of the affected cells. For example, in particularly the trials which have been made with the non-small cell carcinoma of lung. And furthermore, there are some army within our body, we know that as antibodies. So development of antibodies against the vector viruses may render this therapy in long run, e.g. in the treatment of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, where you need multiple uh, gene therapy uh, episodes. So multiple schedules of gene therapy, this may be hampered due to development of the antibody against the vector virus, just we are facing the same problem during development of our vaccines against coronavirus. The first dose vector that is adenovirus in your COVID shield, if the strain is not selected properly, then there are already antibodies, which will destroy the adenovirus itself before it reaches the target cells. And if you repeat the same strain again, then the antibodies which have been generated of the, uh, after the first dose against the adenovirus may render the second adenovirus ineffective also. So you have to circumvent this challenge also. And 
in contrast to the replacement therapy of the uh, genes, repair therapy of the genes are much more comfortable because you are not uh, introducing any new set of genes there. What you are doing, you are repairing the defect. If you can you repair the defect in your computer successfully, and this is a good computer, suppose, then why should you go for a new computer or replacement of the computer? So the same thing is here also. If it is possible to repair the defective gene, if the engineers or rather the genetic engineers have been that much efficient that they have been able to repair the DNA within the cell at the exact target point, then what is the need of introducing a total new gene? So repair in the gene or repair in the DNA is more preferable uh, process for the gene therapy. The newly introduced, what happens here? The newly introduced gene in gene replacement therapy may not harbor the correct place in the DNA. That is the fault of the gene replacement therapy. The repair of the defective gene may work in this area because it is targeted. And as the repair gene is always in situ, so it enjoys its own regulatory sequence also, as before also. Suppose you have replaced the lac Z gene or lac A gene of the lac operon. You have repaired it. So it will enjoy its own position. That is the region of the promoter region, a region of the operator region as before. And being more site specific because as it is targeted, they reduce the chances of insertional neurogenesis. There is an inherent problem of replacement gene therapy. Because in replacement gene therapy, what happens you know, the genes, uh, they can be integrated into wrong places sometimes if they're not targeted well. And if they are integrated in the transgene, in fact, they are integrated in the wrong place under a wrong promoter, under a strong promoter, then that may result in severe problems. So repair is more preferable thing and that can be targeted at two regions, two regions as we all know, change of the defective base in the chromosomal DNA, that is this thing. Simply repair the defective base in the chromosome of the DNA and altering the defective gene in the coding environment. So what do you choose between these two? To repair the DNA or to repair the RNA? The major hint is that each of them has got advantages as well as disadvantages. Now you have to weigh between these two. Let us how it is done. Now, if you repair, choose the DNA to be repaired, the advantages are the repair of the defective gene in the DNA is a permanent process because you know that RNAs are temporary. So you repair them, it does its job, it is finished, and the job is finished. So it is temporary and due to their high turnover. Okay. So once done successfully, if you can do it successfully, it stays lifelong and need not be repeated. So saving of time and effort and money, everything. But what is the great disadvantage? If not targeted accurately, it may affect some healthy nearby genes permanently and cause permanent mutations. It cannot revoke it because DNAs are there for permanent period throughout the human being's life. In contrast to this, if we see the RNA repairs, the advantages are definitely that what? They are temporary. Definitely we have known that they are temporary. So due to their temporariness, they have high turnover rate, and so no risk of permanent mutagenesis, even if the mutagenesis is there due to wrong insertion. The only disadvantage is that it has to be repeated frequently because it is not permanent. So what should you choose between these two? The permanent uh, DNA repair that will go throughout the life without any need for reinfusion 
or to save the person or to save the person against cancer in spite of the repeated intention we generally prefer that the person may not have some some severe worst incidences like cancers so generally the rna repairs they are more common rna based gene therapies they are more common than the dna based gene therapies but still we should know the basics of this gene therapy using dna repair these are very fundamental issues which you have read well during the recombination processes that using the principles of homologous recombination and using the principles of double strand break repair so this is the principle that you are well acquainted with is the uh, gene therapy that uses the homologous recombination technique what happens that you know that homologous chromosomes we have got two homologous chromosomes in our somatic cells and we know that these two homologous chromosomes one come from each of our parents and during the recombination during cell division uh, these homologous chromosomes they pair up and when they pair up then they exchange their information that is the homologous chromosomes so this is found in the germ cells particular germ cells also during the meiosis the recombination occurs in between the homologous chromosomes and during this meiosis the germ cells they exchange their information like this now if you know this thing and insert a particular selection marker that means a therapeutic gene here in a gene targeting vector this is the new gene that has been synthesized in the lab suppose it is homologous to the defective chromosome number 13 which is carrying a defect at this position that is yellow position and you are synthesizing a homologous chromosome to the chromosome number 13 with the same uh, with the therapeutic gene or the corrected gene at the same position insert it it will recombine with its own homologous chromosome that is the defect is here suppose suppose the defect is here at this position is the defect suppose then what will happen that after the successful homologous recombination the therapeutic gene will be inserted here that has been shown to be inserted here and this chromosome will become normal and this is a permanent cure so this is by gene this is the gene therapy using the homologous the combination now the second one that is the double strand break repair it also enjoys some of the homologous recombination how this will be very clear now now suppose you induce an artificial dsb or double strand break in a particular chromosome by an endonuclease here that is the en as shown here and then this double strand break will try to rejoin again it will try to rejoin again and now what you do you create an exogenous dna like this thing this one and this exogenous dna has a homology arm with this broken part that is double strand break okay and this homology if it is introduced with the exogenous dna then due to the homologous recombination back this double strand break repair this double strand break that contain the mutant gene this yellow colored these are the mutant genes this yellow colored ones these are the mutant genes these mutant genes will be replaced by this green therapeutic genes after recombining themselves so what do you do you choose the mutated gene He induced a double strand break, one on each side of the mutated gene, and then you suppose this was the mutant gene. He have created a break here and a break here. So after this double strand break, you are recombining it with an exogenous DNA artificially created, which contains the right gene. 
or we call it therapeutic gene, right gene. In both of the duple strands. So it has to be a duple strand DNA. And introduce that, they will undergo recombination by the same process as the homologous recombinations. And ultimately what happens, the healthy genes, therapeutic genes would be uh, inserted into the area of the defective genes. So you get the corrected gene like this. So these two methods are the major methods for uh, strategies for DNA repairing. Now we have discussed the advantages and disadvantages of both DNA and RNA repair. And we have also talked that RNA repair is more commonly investigated than the DNA repair and more currently being investigated also. So let us first understand the basic principles of the strategies. Strategy means it is a strategy for uh, <clears throat> making the ground principles, making the algorithm, how you are going to approach the RNA. And that means that it is not sufficient to introduce just the therapeutic gene through a virus or through a plasmid into the cell. The more important thing is to understand how that therapeutic gene will be introduced into the target area. Because it is repair and it is target specific. So for that insertion within the cell, you need to understand some basic principles. You need to utilize the same principles the body uses. The first one is the splicing mechanism. You know that in our splicing mechanism, this is the normal splicing that occurs in our DNA, oh, sorry, in our uh, pre-mRNA molecule. There are several SNA RNA, uh, RNA which are catalytic in fact, that is U1, then uh, U2, U4. What they do, they bind up to particular sequences within the pre-RNA. They make us spliceosomes. That is the most important thing that is here. And after making the spliceosome, what they do, they cleave themselves with the RNA catalytic activity. Okay. Some make the lariat, some do not make, but whatever they do, they cleave the RNA so that you get ultimately the mature mRNA like this. This is the mature mRNA. This one which is devoid of its intervening, many intervening sequences. So this is the splicing mechanism. Okay. And another mechanism for splicing is not that the plisosome, it is due to the ribozyme. The ribozymes, they splice the pre-mRNAs using group one ribozymes, group one introns ribozymes. So what they do, this red colored thing is the ribozyme. It is another RNA catalytic enzyme. And it has got, suppose it has got a sequence here. You can induce a sequence of bases here in the ribozyme. This sequence is W here. And this sequence can be complementary to a particular sequence of the pre mRNA that it is going to cleave also. Now, if this green exogenous sequence or endogenous sequence is complementary to this target free mRNA, then it will switch here and the ribozyme will now carry on the splicing or the cleavage. So this part, that means this blue part from the site of cleavage will be removed. And this green part was coming from for, with the ribozyme will be attached here. Using the ligation mechanism. So this is ribozyme induced uh, splicing, which can be, the figure itself shows you that you can use this mechanism to introduce a correct gene in place of a defective gene. Okay. So now after understanding the mechanisms of normal splicing and the ribozyme mediating mediated. So these two mechanisms, that is uh, the splicing mechanisms and the ribozyme mechanisms can be used for uh, this RNA-based 
target therapy, gene target therapy. Say for example, this is the ribosome mediated splicing and this is the ribozyme which is targeted to treat a disorder that is known as your uh, myo, uh, that is your uh, deficiency of a dystrophic uh, muscular protein kinase, myotropic protein kinase, dystrophic myotropic protein kinase. Now, this protein kinase, which is related with the myotropic dystrophy, it is incorporated in the target mRNA. And this target mRNA, that is this ribozyme, has got a much shorter length and it replaces the defective toxic repeat ex expansion of this disease. And ultimately, you get the corrected uh, mRNA length. So this is ribozyme mediated transplants. The second one is the cystic fibrosis target gene that is CFTR, CFTR. That is cystic fibrosis transconductance regulator protein. That is rather corrected by a spliceosome mechanism. That is spliceosome mediated RNA transcription. And this smart technique, in fact, what it does that it incorporates a particular spliceo, splicing pre-treated molecule of RNA. That is a splicing RNA. This splicing RNA, it is incorporated with a corrected exon or corrected sequence. Say, for example, there are so many mutations of the CFTR. So some of these mutations, suppose these are spanning from this region to this region. So all of these mutations, they have been corrected using the correct sequence within this exon 10 to 25, within this pre-treated mRNA molecule or pre-treated uh, small nuclear RNA molecule that is going to attach to the binding domain of the pre-mRNA and ultimately create its own plisosome and remove these defective genes all together. Remove these defective genes all together and create a, not, uh, create a new healthy gene. So in this way, we have understood that this uh, particularly, the strategies for RNA repair, they utilize these three mechanisms. And among these three mechanisms, these two we have studied today, that is transplicing using the spliceosomes, using the SMART technique, and transplicing using ribozymes. Trans means that it has been exogenously induced. So that is the word uh, trans means. Cis being, being its normal native form. And the third one, this we will study tomorrow. Because I think today I have already uh, spoken for one hour. And uh, tomorrow we have got a very interesting session also where we will discuss about this thing, including the RNA interference, the CRISPR technology, and the several viral vectors, that is adenovirus and other viruses which are utilized for gene therapy. So today up to this, I finish it here today. Okay, so goodbye for today and good night. Uh, whatever question you have, you keep it with yourself. Tomorrow, I will give you sufficient time for a detailed discussion about this presentation. Okay, thank you so much. So tomorrow we'll having the next Thank you.